2020. On the same occasion as we decided to cancel the P-1154 and the transport aircraft, but Wilson was very frightened because there was much more public interest in the TSR-2 than the other aircraft <coughs> to put it in the same package. So he asked us to delay it until the budget in April. And that's when the formal decision was taken and announced. He called the contractors at midday to the ministry uh, on the day in which cancellation was to be announced in the budget debate. And he told them that it was going to be cancelled. So immediately they did what any reasonable person would. They requested permission to ring up their workforce, to ring up their factories and to warn everybody themselves rather than allow them to learn about this frightful blow in their lives over the radio or the newspaper. And Roy Jenkins refused. He said it was a budget secret. Quite extraordinary. And we never got a satisfactory explanation of why it was done that way. And uh, I, I still don't understand why it was done that way, because it, well, it really was, it was an insult to the House <laughs> to make an announcement in that particular form where there was no possibility of questioning at all. Oh, it was uh, just a feeling of inevitability. We'd been struggling. We'd put every possible effort, uh, and when I say we, I mean the whole workforce, the, all the engineers, the ground staff, uh, the air crew, of course, the flight developers, the airworthiness people, administrators backing it all up, had been working on a, an all-hours basis. Uh, there was no knock-off time. You worked on through the night. Uh, leave was cancelled, family arrangements were disrupted, tensions developed in families because husbands were overworked, overstressed. This had been going on for years. Well, I think there was a tremendous feeling of letdown initially. You know, it, it was a, a terrible disappointment to a lot of people who were thoroughly committed to the project, which was just beginning to fly and, and you know, taking, literally taking off. Everybody who was concerned with the efficiency of the Air Force thought that the TSR-2 would be too late in service to meet the Air Force's needs. That was the first thing. Secondly, its cost had tripled in the four years before I got in. Uh, its time of delivery had extended by three years, and there was no guarantee they'd have kept to the cost and timing as I was given it. Well, I think the nail in the coffin, the sort of trigger reason, was when the Australians refused to buy it and opted for the American plane at the beginning of 1964. In order not to waste all the knowledge and the potential uh, knowledge to be gained from these things, and also, of course, with an eye on trying to keep people in employment, not only in our factories, but in the component factories and suppliers, we put forward a program um, to, to the Ministry within two weeks of cancellation, proposing that the two pro prototypes should be kept on, I think, a 100-hour uh, test and development program um, uh, for research into the future Concorde test program, because they're very similar types of aeroplanes. Um, much valuable information could be gained, and I think we put it forward on the basis of a fixed-price contract we were asking for one and a half million pounds to do a hundred hours of, of, de of concentrated research. Uh, Roy Jenkins said uh, that means it must cost at least two million and in my experience you've got to double that and that means four million and that's too much. So uh, there was a complete, uh, a complete shock. Following the cancellation came one of the most bizarre episodes in the history of British aviation. For some, it appeared that the cancellation of TSR-2 was not enough. Orders were given to destroy everything. publicity was given, obviously with official blessing, uh, to operatives 
in our factories who had actually built these airframes, dragging them out onto the tarmac, uh, shoving oily rags in them and setting fire to them, particularly to the magnesium areas which burnt like a hollow horse. I think it's the most shameful aspect of this sad story. There is no sort of reason whatsoever except uh, what you could really describe as a selfish determination to ensure that that aeroplane would never be built under any other circumstances or in the future. I never heard anybody connected with this project uh, who um, was other than shocked by this decision. I can't tell you who took it, but uh, it, it, uh, the finger must point at the government in some, in, in, in one department or other. Well, it wasn't ordered by me, I can tell you that. Absolutely not. And I don't think it was ordered by Roy Jenkins, who was the only other minister who would have had a say. Uh, I know then that I just had the immense, um, uh, dramatic task uh, of um, inviting hu some hundreds of my staff to consider the fact that they were going to be made redundant. And all these dedicated people of high skills were just shown their, uh, shown their cards, and many of them went to America, of course. In America, in 1964, the F-111 was taking shape. Following meetings with Defense Secretary Robert McNamara, Dennis Healy had become convinced that the F-111 would fulfill the RAF's requirements while being cheaper and in service earlier than TSR-2. Events would prove him wrong as this project also ran into problems of delay and spiralling costs, a fact that the Australians would later come to pay dearly for. Whilst Dennis Healy was talking to McNamara, Prime Minister Wilson was meeting President Johnson to discuss a number of areas of mutual interest. Wilson wanted U.S. backing for the pending loan from the IMF. The thinking back in Britain was that the Americans had extracted a heavy price for their support by demanding the cancellation of TSR-2. I don't think international diplomacy operates quite so crudely as that. Um, we wanted good relations with the Americans. But there was never any suggestion in my mind that... Um, uh, a condition for having um, IMF support. The Americans wanted a variety of things. They, they, wanted, um, they wanted to sustain sterling as a sort of auxiliary currency to the dollar. The IMF had already decided a week earlier to give us the loan we needed. And we got the necessary loan from other governments as well. So that didn't enter into the discussions in any way. They wanted us to maintain an east of Suez Road, as it were, to share a world road with us. And they were quite keen to, um, um, not specifically that we should cancel the TSR-2, but they would like us to buy the F-111, for exactly the same reason that we would like the Australians to, to, to buy the TSR-2. Britain did order the F-111, but ironically, the deal would later fall victim to exactly the same problems that plagued TSR-2. In the interim, the RAF found themselves having to deal with the gap that TSR-2's cancellation had caused. What we had to do when it was removed from the program was to start um, innovating, improvising, um, and, and making good the shortfall. And that's something which the Royal Air Force historically has always been extremely good at. And of course, what we did was to um, uh, re-plan uh, and reprogram and retrain the V-Force uh, so that it could go low level for part of its attacks. That was one of the moves that we, we, that we uh, 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 put on the board in order to make good the deficiency of the TSR-2. Well, I think TSR-2 um, is probably an example, and it's it's uh, wrong to lay down the law on the matter when you, you, you know, when you don't know all the facts and haven't got access to all the books and records. But I think it is an example, and we've seen far too many of them um, before and since, and even to this day, of British government